Good evening, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for our program this evening, which is presented under the auspices of the IDIC, the Jewish Center's Israel Dialogue Initiative Committee. My name is Harold Heft, and I'm the IDIC chairperson. Our committee is charged with providing congregants with programming that examines in depth those aspects of Israel and Israeli society that are sometimes controversial or confounding to American Jews and are seldom broached in other TJC programming. The committee was originally established by the Jewish Center Board a few years ago in an environment of significant polarization in our congregation, polarization related to Israel and its domestic and international policies and politics, and polarization regarding the perceived obligations and relationship of the American diaspora to Israel. IDIC's original task was to determine how TJC would engage in political discussion pertaining to the state of Israel, while maintaining the need to reflect the congregation's commitment to the Jewish state of Israel, to educate congregants, and especially to maintain a strong sense of community. IDIC's responsibility now is to identify topics, establish programs, and select expert speakers that will meet those criteria. This evening's program is the second of two lectures addressing the March 23rd Israeli election and its effects. I will offer information on two new programs planned for this fall right after our Q&A tonight. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the IDIC for their energy, creativity, and expertise. They are Rabbi Justice Baird, Ra'anan Bustan, Moshe Margolin, Ruth Shulman, and Bernie Fleitman, who is our technical maven running the show behind the scenes this evening. We've received wonderful support from TJC's executive director, Joel Berger, from our president, Randy Brett, and our VP of programming, Heidi Joseph. Tonight's program was generously underwritten by the Jewish Center and by donors in our congregation, and we thank you all very much. Before we introduce uh, our speaker tonight, I'd like to go over a few details about asking questions and making comments. Because our audience is over 100 attendees, I ask you to please submit your questions and comments using Zoom's Q&A function. You'll notice that the chat function has been disabled, so please use Q&A to submit your questions and comments. On your Zoom screen, you will see an icon that is labeled Q&A. Simply click on that and it will open a box that looks like this. Type your question or comment in there, and when you're done, click on the blue send box to submit your question or comment. Your screen may look slightly different depending on the operating system and platform that you're on. Our moderators, Justice Baird and Ranan Bustan, will review all of the submissions and present as many of them as they can to our speaker for his response. And this will ensure that more questions and comments are covered with fewer switching delays. During the lecture, the moderators will concentrate on questions of clarification if necessary. At the end of the lecture, they will present your deeper questions and comments, and we intend to reserve at least 20 minutes for closing questions and conversation at the end of the program. So thank you again, and I now ask my colleague and friend, Ruth Shulman, to introduce tonight's speaker. Ambassador, Ambassador Daniel, we have a... Uh, Okay. Ambassador Daniel Kurtzer is internationally renowned as a diplomat who has lived, shaped, and now teaches Middle East complexities at Princeton University. Born just up the road in Elizabeth, New Jersey, he received his undergraduate degree from Yeshiva College in New York City and his doctorate in political science from Columbia and someplace along the way, I believe he also served as Dean of Yeshiva College. But at the age of 27, he entered the US State Department, starting what would become a long thread of public service. He was serving as a junior officer in the American Embassy in Cairo in 1981, when Anwar Sadat was assassinated. He then was transferred to Israel for a few years. Then in the late 80s, back in the US, he was appointed Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for Near, for Near Eastern Affairs, specializing in intelligence and research. 
1997, already known as a respected, knowledgeable, and nonpartisan person, Dr. Kurtzer was appointed by Democratic President Bill Clinton to a four-year term as U.S. Ambassador to Egypt. Four years later, in 2001, when that term ended, he was appointed by Republican President George Bush to a four-year term as U.S. Ambassador to Israel. Once asked why he was drawn to the Middle East, it said that he answered, well, it's not a place where tuxedos and cocktail parties characterize diplomacy. No, <laughs> rather he coordinated multilateral peace talks between Israel and Palestinians, Israel and Syria, and helped bring about the Madrid Peace Conference. In June, 2008, after leaving the Foreign Service, he endorsed then Senator Barack Obama's candidacy for the presidency and was among the principal authors of Obama's address on the Middle East to the annual APAC conference in June, 2008. Ambassador Kurtzer has published numerous articles and research papers, co-authored two books, the first entitled Negotiating Arab-Israeli Peace and the second entitled The Peace Puzzle. Those of us who live in town were delighted when Princeton University beckoned Ambassador Kurtzer, where he is now firmly ensconced as distinguished professor, serving as the S. Daniel Abraham Professor of Middle East Policy Studies in the School of Public and International Affairs. For the years he and his wife, Sheila, lived in Princeton, they generously shared their friendship with the community and Jewish Center members. Welcome back, Ambassador Kurtzer. Ruth, thank you very much for that uh, very warm uh, welcome. It is good to be back in Princeton virtually. And uh, I would like to share uh, Sheila and my fondness for the 13 years that we lived in Princeton before moving to DC to be closer to grandchildren. Uh, it was a great experience. The uh, session tonight uh, has been advertised as looking at the implications of two elections, those in the United States and those in Israel. But we're actually in the midst of four elections, our own, the Israeli elections, Palestinian elections, which were supposed to take place in late May for their parliament, but which just today were postponed, and Iranian presidential elections scheduled for June. And this confluence of elections suggests that this is a very challenging period in the Middle East uh, for change that uh, has yet to be uh, foretold. So what I wanna do tonight is look a little bit more closely at a couple of the core issues on the US and Israeli agenda and to look ahead at how these might play out in the days ahead. Uh, of course, prophecy uh, left the Holy Land some years ago so this will mostly be analysis. And I look forward to the Q&A and discussion uh, as we can share ideas about where things may or may not go. Uh, whereas uh, our election uh, last November produced a winner, even if it didn't produce a unified uh, political system, the Israeli election has not yet uh, produced a winner. There's continued deadlock. The mandate that was given to Prime Minister Netanyahu to try to form a coalition government is about to expire. And the president of Israel, Ruben Rivlin, may hand that mandate over to another Knesset member, but it's not even clear whether that member, whether it's Yair Lapid or Naftali Bennett, will be able to form a government, which means that Israel may be heading to its fifth election in the last two years, suggesting that as divided as our own country is, Israel is perhaps even more divided on core issues relating not only to the peace process between uh, the Palestinians and the state of Israel, but also on basic issues relating to Israeli society. Both societies, in fact, are challenged today by uh, issues relating to democratic governance. There are still large numbers of Americans who refuse to accept the results of our election. And we see this played out in obstructionist politics on Capitol Hill, uh, 
uh, in the context of a president who's looking for transformational change. But we also see in Israel some controversial legislation. A couple of years ago, the nation state law, uh, actions by Prime Minister Netanyahu to try to appoint a justice minister that turned out to be illegal. He had to retract that appointment. Or the recognition by the Israeli system of parties associated with the Kahanist movement. In other words, both countries face challenges related to their internal governance and how they have organized their societies. This suggests that there are some new and potentially disturbing trends that both of us, very strong allies, very deep friendship between our countries need to grapple with in the period ahead. In the United States, progressives are questioning some core elements uh, with regard to American policy in the Middle East, particularly the relationship with Israel. And some are even suggesting that the United States ought to condition its security assistance to Israel, something that has never uh, before uh, been proposed. There are some think tanks and human rights organizations which have produced some very controversial reports. The Brookings Institution and the US, US Middle East Project just published a study that suggested that instead of a peace process, hopefully ending in a two-state solution, the United States ought to uh, uh, follow a rights-based approach. In other words, an approach that essentially would lead to a one-state outcome in which Palestinians would be given full and equal rights with the uh, current citizens of Israel. Just the other day, Human Rights Watch, an important non-governmental organization, published a 200-page report on Israeli practices and policies in the occupied territories, which had the goal of suggesting that Israel was an apartheid state which had committed crimes against humanity. In other words, there are challenges now from a variety of sources, domestically and in the region, and also internationally with the International Criminal Court's decision to look into Israeli crimes against humanity in its occupation practices. In Israel, the uh, swing vote has now turned decidedly to the right. Even though the Knesset uh, composition is uh, very badly skewered, in a sense, uh, leading to this stalemate in forming a coalition, the fact is that 72% of the Israeli electorate voted for parties that are considered to be right wing when it comes to the Arab-Israeli conflict. And we've seen some of this impact on the streets. In response to Palestinian attacks uh, in Jerusalem on ultra-Orthodox Jews, uh, Jews in Jerusalem marched against Palestinians calling for death to Arabs. And this was led by those Kahanist parties. So we have a situation in which our uh, alliance, uh, which remains as strong as it ever has been, is marked by a number of internal challenges in both countries, which need to be carefully evaluated as we move ahead. In looking at the question of what's on the mind of President Joe Biden, I think it's clear for those of us who uh, listened to or read about his remarks to a joint session of Congress just last night, that Biden sees himself as a transformational president. Looking over the domestic scene, he wants to fix almost everything that uh, now uh, ills, ails American society. Race relations, the economy after COVID, uh, immigration, uh, infrastructure. In other words, wherever the uh, eye can see, Biden sees problems which government can play a role in fixing. He has asked for, as you know, a significant amount of new funding. We're likely to see tax increases in some, on some uh, taxable income to pay for it. But Biden is comparing himself in many ways to the challenges faced by FDR uh, before uh, World War II. In other words, the need to reorient and refocus American society. And hopefully, he says, he would like to reach across the aisle and create a bipartisan relationship with Republicans uh, that uh, would hopefully move the country forward. 
But as he does keep this uh, razor sharp focus on domestic affairs, the foreign policy agenda will not uh, allow him uh, to ignore uh, issues abroad uh, during this period. Clearly on the president's mind are the challenges faced uh, by, that the United States faces uh, from China. And he identified China as the biggest threat to American uh, security over the period ahead. He suggested ways in which the United States uh, needed to rebuild, as he says, rebuild better in order to compete better with the Chinese. But this also includes major security challenges in the South China Sea, uh, in the so-called Belt and Road Initiative in which China is trying to expand the number of countries with which it has trade and security relations. And that includes in the Middle East as well. Recently, as you know, China negotiated a long-term contract with Iran for the provision of fossil fuels that will bind Iran and China for perhaps the next 30 years with Chinese influence growing exponentially, not only in Iran, but also in the Persian Gulf more generally. Russia also represents a threat to American interests and to the region. We saw Russian engagement in Syria to prop up the dictator Bashar al-Assad, and we saw a demonstration of Russian military uh, capabilities in its activities since 2015. Russia has sold advanced weaponry to Turkey, is looking to sell advanced weaponry to our allies in Egypt, and is trying to expand its sphere of influence uh, throughout the region. And all of this represents a challenge to the United States. And it's a challenge which can be defined either as a threat or as a possibility of a cooperation as well as a competition. The administration has also reaffirmed in very strong words, our relationship with the state of Israel, but one can discern a, an almost palpable distance in some regards between the president and prime minister Netanyahu. You recall that during the Obama administration in which Biden served as the vice president, relations had hit rock bottom between the two leaders, name calling and distrust and operating behind the back of the other side. Now Biden, I think, has taken some of that aboard, does not want to repeat it for sure, but believes, I think, that Netanyahu continues to see Israel's interests best reflected in relations with the Republican Party rather than the Democratic Party. And as such, Biden is being very cautious and careful in his personal relationships with Netanyahu. You recall that it took some weeks before the president uh, reached out to Netanyahu after the election. You recall also that even though there are close communications right now on Iran, which we'll talk about in more detail in a few minutes. The fact is that those communications are happening at the professional level, and there hasn't been a meeting, certainly not personally, but even by phone to discuss perhaps the most important issue on the bilateral agenda. The United States uh, continues to criticize Israeli policies in the West Bank, particularly settlements, but Biden has been careful not to exacerbate the differences between us. And that criticism of settlements has been relatively moderate relative to what we had seen, not only in the Obama administration, but even in previous uh, Republican administrations. Uh, and the administration uh, so far has retreated to standard language with regard to the search for a two-state solution in a way dissociating itself from the policies of the Trump administration, which had uh, sought to take American, uh, uh, the American approach to peace in a very different direction, but without any indication that the administration uh, seeks to advance the prospects of peace. In other words, we will support it, Biden is saying, but uh, until the parties are really ready to move forward on their own, uh, the United States will not play a very active role. Biden is, as you know, one of the most knowledgeable foreign policy presidents we've ever had. 
probably akin to George H.W. Bush in terms of experience and the personal contacts that he's had with leaders throughout the region. But he has certainly uh, calculated that he cannot afford to jeopardize uh, any Democrat votes on any of his domestic agenda items uh, by having a quarrel with the state of Israel. And therefore, for reasons not associated with our bilateral relationship with Israel, we're likely to see this very careful minuet between the two leaders, at least until the Israeli political system uh, develops a, uh, a coalition or produces a coalition. Now, there are at least two spanners in the works that may uh, change the administration's approach to Israel and to the Middle East generally. One of them has to do with what might be called the troubled spots, the troubled areas, the protracted conflicts in this region that uh, don't seem to end. Uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, Yemen, Libya, the endless wars that have kept American forces in this region since, in the case of Afghanistan, 2001, in the case of Iraq, 2003, uh, endless uh, efforts to deal with uh, terrorism. No one has smart policy answers to deal with this. And these conflict zones continue to spawn radicalism, terrorism, and uh, failed governance. This leads to a, an excess of human distress Yemen today is perhaps the most significant humanitarian crisis that the world faces, but it's not far ahead in terms of humanitarian distress to other places in this very troubled region. The perception of American withdrawal that has been fostered by statements about the pivot to Asia that go back even into the Bush administration have also created a great deal of uncertainty among our friends in the region. Now, the good news as a result of this is that this contributed in part to the so-called Abraham Accords, because certain Arab states felt if they could no longer rely upon an American security umbrella to deal with the threats that they faced, for example, vis-a-vis -vis Iran, they needed to associate with the strongest regional power, namely the state of Israel. So that's the positive side of the perception of American withdrawal. But the negative side is that that perception feeds into the possibility of additional Chinese and Russian penetration. And you end up in a kind of reinforcing cycle uh, that may or may not be accurate in reality, but uh, perception in a sense becomes reality uh, over time. The second potential spanner in the works both with regard to the bilateral uh, US-Israeli relationship and more broadly, the US relationship with the region, of course, relates to the Iran nuclear talks. And in this respect, the uh, negotiations that are underway even today in Vienna among America's partners in the so-called Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, the Iran nuclear deal that was agreed in 2015 on the one side and Iran on the other side are uh, attempting to reach an agreement for the re-entry of the United States into that agreement and the resumption of the provisions of that agreement uh, that would apply to both sides. While this is happening, uh, both Israel and Iran are escalating their actions against each other. Israel seeking to delay, if not set back uh, for a significant period of time, Iran's nuclear program. Uh, we saw recently a major electrical failure at the Natanz uh, nuclear facility. Uh, initially, the Iranians said that it was an internal electrical problem, but most experts believe that it was uh, contributed to from the outside, probably by Israeli uh, operatives. Uh, when this happened, the Iranians did not and still have not responded directly but there was an announcement almost immediately after that, that Iran would begin uh, enriching uranium up to 60%. We'll talk about this in a minute because this is an extraordinarily dangerous development. So the idea of uh, escalation here is not out of the question. 
And whereas Israel and Iran believe that there can be controlled escalation, the problem is what happens if there's an unintended uh, accident, which leads to a, an action spiral, an action reaction spiral that uh, escalates beyond the desires of both parties. And it leads to the largest question of all, which is, is there a right policy, a correct policy with respect to the Iran nuclear program? I wanna put up a, a screen to show how uh, comprehensively challenging this is. If you look at the elements that uh, go into uh, a potential Iran nuclear deal, in other words, the elements that uh, existed uh, from 2015 when the uh, uh, JCPOA, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, uh, first went into effect, you can see that this is not a simple matter of Iran's stopping its program and the West, the United States providing sanctions relief. In fact, you see the various levels of activities which needed to be and today need to be dealt with in order for the uh, program to be uh, brought under control. And it really comes down to the question of the level of enrichment that the Iranians will be permitted uh, to continue and the amount of highly enriched uranium, HEU, that will result from their enrichment. This relates and the second level down to the number and type of centrifuges. These are the machines that spin and uh, enrich the uranium. It, re it relates to the size of the uh, nuclear stockpile. It relates to the various facilities that the Iranians have built to carry out their program, all of which uh, were impacted by the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action in 2015, but all of which are now either back in business or resuming business since the Trump administration pulled the United States out of the JCPOA in 2018. And the real measure here of the Iranian program has to do with what's called the breakout timeline. In other words, how long would it take Iran to move from where it is to the development of weapons grade material that could be weaponized and delivered. Now, if we go back in history in the late 1990s, the argument at that time was Iran was within a year of a breakout. And during the course of these past 25 or so years, that timeline has moved up and down. As a result of the JCPOA in 2015, the breakout time extended beyond a year. Since 2018, experts believe that the timeline has been reduced perhaps to as little as six months, if not even less time. In other words, watching that point at which the Iranians go hell bent for a nuclear weapon becomes the guidepost to see how uh, effective the efforts are to stop the program. One of the concerns about the JCPOA in 2015 related to its duration. It basically had a number of what were called sunset clauses. In other words, uh, timelines that came to an end after 10, 12, or 15 years. And the argument that the Obama administration made in accepting an agreement with those sunset clauses was that that gave the United States and others 10, 12, or 15 years to build a better agreement that might last uh, beyond that initial period. This could be achieved through transparency of the agreement, extensive and intrusive verification and inspection was set up under the JCPOA. And uh, as a result, or in response to Iranian uh, actions in fulfilling its commitments under the JCPOA, the United States uh, and the international community removed uh, the sanctions that had been imposed uh, back in uh, 2011 by the United Nations Security Council. Now, all of this uh, was positively impacted by the 2015 agreement, and all of this was negatively impacted by the United States withdrawal 
in 2018, because everything that Iran did to comply with the agreement after 2015 ended up being reversed. The administration of Donald Trump imposed massive sanctions on Iran, but it didn't stop the Iranian program. What it did do was to hurt the Iranian people, no question about it, but the government did not divert any of the, uh, uh, or did not uh, move any of the funds that were needed to help people away from programs that were designed to help the nuclear program succeed. And so the massive sanctions having been given these past three years to have an impact on Iranian behavior really have been a failure. And so the argument that's made that if we only give them more time to have an impact, if we only let the massive sanctions remain or and or if we hold out for a better agreement, uh, we will be better off. And this becomes part of the debate. Now, what are the issues that were not covered in the JCPOA? One of them has to do with Iran's quite negative behaviors and actions, aggressive behaviors and actions elsewhere in the Middle East. About uh, 17 years ago, the King of Jordan coined this term, the Shia Crescent. As you know, Islam is divided into two main uh, pathways, uh, the Sunnis who are a majority and the Shia. But in uh, many parts of the Middle East, uh, the Shia are significant minorities or majorities. And if you see, starting from the bottom of this slide, where in Yemen, 35 to 40% of the population are Shia, in Bahrain, a significant number of uh, uh, Bahraini Arabs are uh, also uh, Shia. Uh, Iran, the number is 90 to 95%. Iraq, almost 50%. Syria, 15 to 20%, and Lebanon, 45 to 55%. In other words, in addition to whatever strategic and other calculations countries make with regard to their foreign policies, there's a commonality of religion in these countries that binds them and represents what in the uh, estimation of some of the Sunni countries represents a threat to their security. Uh, Iran also maintains a very significant missile program. That program is covered by United Nations Security Council resolutions, uh, but Iran continues to develop uh, longer range missiles that can reach not only Israel, but also into Southern Europe, Southern Russia, and ultimately even uh, places beyond. So the debate that we're watching over the Iran uh, nuclear deal uh, which is taking place literally today. This week, uh, senior Israeli security officials, including their national security advisor, the head of Mossad, their intelligence service, the head of their military intelligence, their national security advisor. In other words, a number of very senior officials have been in Washington physically in order to uh, consult very closely with the administration. This is a very positive development. This consultation did not take place in this manner in the run-up to the agreement in 2015. But even the relatively moderate statements that have been coming out of both delegations, the Israeli and American delegations, suggests that the gulf between our positions on whether or not to go back into the JCPOA, the nuclear deal of 2015, that gulf remains very, very wide. And just today, the Israeli Minister of Intelligence suggested that if Israel is not satisfied with American policy with regard to the Iran nuclear deal, it will not only go it alone, but it can go it alone. He's saying that Israeli military capabilities extend even as far as Iran. Now, the other large question that uh, continues to befuddle the United States, of course, are differences of view with respect to uh, Israeli-Palestinian relations. In this regard, there is a kind of, I call it a dilemma that uh, Israeli policies and practices have uh, presented to the United States, not just in the current administration, but going back to 1967, when Israel occupied these territories as a result 
of the 1967 war. Uh, Israeli governments since 1967, as you know, have declined to decide what to do with the territories that they were able to occupy in that defensive war. In other words, Israel was attacked. It preemptively attacked in some cases, but it was because it was threatened. But afterwards, uh, for many, many decades, Israel, Israeli cabinets, governments, uh, declined to define its own policies with regard to what to do with those territories. And what that's resulted in is that the settler movement, especially starting in the early 1970s, but continuing until today, has largely determined the agenda of what Israel does in the occupied territories. There are now perhaps 750,000 settlers, in other words, Israeli citizens who have moved into the territories that Israel occupied in 1967. Not only have they built settlements that uh, are considered to be legal under the Israeli legal system, but they've built several hundred settlements illegally under the Israeli system. And Israel is now in the process of ex post facto legalization of what are called outposts. This was an issue, in fact, that was on the agenda of the Bush administration when I was serving as ambassador. The Israeli government committed in 2004 to uh, remove the outposts, the settlements that had been built without Israeli government sanction, without approval. That hasn't happened. And just the opposite has happened. Since that time, a process has been underway to uh, legalize these outposts uh, after the fact. There are many restrictions on Palestinian uh, building, uh, the issuing of permits, on movement, as you know, because of the possibility of uh, terrorists and suicide bombers coming in, Israel built a, a security fence and wall and Palestinian movement is channeled very significantly through checkpoints, uh, both fixed checkpoints and what are called flying checkpoints. And there are significant restrictions on Palestinian economic activity. At the same time, there is a, a lax approach to violence by settlers, another indication that settlers largely control the agenda in the uh, occupied territories. For many reasons, therefore, Israel has become something of a hotspot in Washington. Uh, both parties, the Republicans and the Democrats, uh, claim the mantle of being Israel's best friend. Uh, the Trump administration took that to an extreme by essentially carrying out an agenda that uh, satisfied uh, all of Prime Minister Netanyahu's desires and more. Uh, the Trump uh, so-called peace plan that was issued uh, about a year ago uh, uh, said to Israel that it could annex up to 30% of the West Bank in return for about 16% of Israel proper being associated with the future Palestinian state. Uh, the United States under Trump said that settlements were not to be considered illegal. And that in fact, we didn't even use the word settlements. And the United States agreed that none of them would need to be uh, removed or withdrawn in the context of a peaceful outcome. The United States recognized Israel's annexation of the Golan Heights. In other words, whatever was on Netanyahu's agenda uh, was satisfied by uh, Trump for whatever reasons, whether it was electoral uh, or emotional. Uh, and that suggested to the Israelis that their best friends uh, were in the uh, Republican uh, party and especially the Trump part of the Republican party. Uh, Israel then uh, further became part of a partisan divide, where Prime Minister Netanyahu was largely seen as uh, supporting Republican aims and hoping that uh, Trump would be reelected. Now, that doesn't solve the, uh, the problem, because as we know, there is a problem for Israel that simply will not go away. And I represented in this Venn diagram because it is not only the simplest way to understand it, but it also is the simplest way to see 
what the dilemma is. On the, the top two circles, democracy and Jewish state, uh, both of these uh, concepts are ensconced in uh, what are called Israeli basic laws. Israel does not have a written constitution, but it has over the years enacted a number of so-called basic laws, which over time will be incorporated in a constitution. And one of those basic laws says very clearly that Israel is a democratic Jewish state. In other words, the majoritarian uh, Jewish population uh, conducting their affairs of governance in a democratic manner. And I think for all of us growing up uh, as we have supporters of Israel, we've uh, intuitively understood this as being part of Israel's DNA. Well, the problem is uh, when you add the third circle at the bottom of this Venn diagram, uh, what to do about the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Because if you want to hold on to the West Bank and East Jerusalem, and you want to remain a democracy, you're gonna end up in a one state solution. Because the reality is going to be that you hold the territory, but you also acquire the people, the Palestinians. And there's no way that Israel is going to refuse to give Palestinians the full rights of citizenship. Uh, the failure to do so would raise the specter of apartheid, and it just is not a, a starting point for any discussion in Israel. And the same thing on the other side. If Israel wants to remain a Jewish state and also to hold on to the territories, it means that they could not uh, offer full citizenship to the Palestinians because of the demographic issue. And they would be characterized then as an apartheid state. In other words, a single state in which there were two different categories of citizenship. Something that, again, the Israeli public simply will not accept. And so if you want to maintain the democratic and Jewish nature, Jewish character of the state of Israel, you end up in a two-state solution by default, where there is a partition between Israel and whatever it is on the other side, in other words, a Palestinian state. And the idea of a democratic occupation simply doesn't exist. You can't hold on to these territories and hope that you could remain democratic uh, while not offering uh, full citizenships, full citizenship. Now, the reality is that there's also a dilemma on the Palestinian side. And Palestinians describe it as follows. If you look at the maps from left to right, Palestinian aspiration has always been for complete control over all of Palestine. Uh, that's represented in the map on the far left, which they call historic Palestine, running from the Jordan River to the Mediterranean. 1937, under the British mandate, the British established the idea of partition. And you see the various ways in which they tried to draw the borders. The green being the Palestinian state, the white part being the state of uh, the Jews, the Zionists, and there's a part in the middle, looks a little bit like an internal organ running from Jerusalem to Jaffa that was supposed to be an international territory. The Zionist movement, as you recall, accepted this idea and the Palestinians rejected it. 1947, the United Nations, uh, after Britain decided to give up the mandate, uh, voted on the partition plan, November 29th, 1947, where the green was to be the state of Palestine or the Arab state, the white was to be the Jewish state, and the little yellow portion around Jerusalem was to be an internationalized city. Once again, the Zionist movement, the precursor of the state of Israel, accepted. The uh, Arabs, uh, Palestinians, and the Arab states rejected, and uh, that led to first civil war between November and May of 47, 48, and then interstate war uh, after that. 1967 is uh, the borders reflected in the fourth map from the left, the borders that we grew up with, many of us, where the green uh, to the right of the map was called the West Bank. It was 
had been annexed by Jordan back in the early 1950s. And the green at the uh, center left of the map being Gaza was under Egyptian military administration. And as a result of that war, Israel occupied both of those territories. And then you end up with the map on the far right, which was a reflection of the so-called Trump peace plan, where the Palestinians saw not only their aspirations for all of Palestine, which they would still like, uh, unfulfilled, but they saw a, a truncated Canton-like or Cantonized state being proposed by the United States. Now, there are many who suggest that this is the Palestinians' own responsibility, having rejected uh, the uh, proposals put forward by uh, the international community and uh, the state of Israel, uh, Palestinians now have to live with the consequences. And that would be a fair assumption if that was also a desirable outcome for the state of Israel. But as I noted, it's not a desirable outcome for the state of Israel, for it leaves open this question of what you do about the people and the territory. In other words, if Israel is going to act only for its own benefit, there are many Israelis who make the argument that it is in Israel's interest to uh, uh, divest itself of these territories. So what's happened over the years is this long list of ideas, proposals, uh, strategies, the, and I'm not gonna review all of them, but on the left are uh, ideas that have been put forward for uh, trying to resolve the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. It runs from the Trump plan to annexation, to unilateral recognition of Palestine, to violent resistance, nonviolent resistance, negotiations, coordinated unilateralism. In other words, if you see behind me a bookshelf full of books, virtually all of them relate to these ideas. And there are hundreds of proposals and many of them make a lot of sense, but none of them has yet garnered the support of Israelis and Palestinians at the same time. Israeli leaders, uh, particularly uh, Rabin, uh, Barak and Olmert have been extremely forthcoming in developing ideas uh, to try to resolve this conflict. Uh, Palestinian leaders have not responded uh, with equal uh, creativity or acceptance. And so we're left with a large number of ideas, but none that has yet uh, uh, garnered the support of both sides at the same time. And those ideas uh, all don't lead necessarily to the same outcome. Because on the right side of this slide, you can have one state, two states, there's an idea of three states, Gaza becoming its own state, uh, status quo, creeping annexation, the Jordanian options, trusteeship, confederation. They're all kind of ideas that how this thing should come to an end. But so far, nobody has figured out a way in which substance and process merge in a uh, positive enough manner. Now, that could come to an end if people followed the Kurtzer peace plan. Because over the years since leaving the State Department, corresponding to ideas that I did propose back then, uh, the suggestion that I've made is that we have to walk, chew gum, and do a lot of other things at the same time. And I've represented it in this little diagram, which suggests that there are probably at least six things that we need to do, the United States and the parties, in order for this uh, conflict to at least potentially see an outcome. Number one, we have to look at top-down. What I mean by that is looking at the core issues, are there bridges, creative bridges possible between the positions of the two sides? Back in the year 2000, President Clinton developed what he called the Clinton parameters, which was a way of trying to take the positions of the two parties and seeing whether or not there were correspondences between them. And in fact, both sides rejected the Clinton parameters when they were put forward. But as soon as Clinton left office, the two sides went off and started negotiating on the basis of the Clinton parameters. Now we know enough today to update those parameters because in 2008, Prime Minister Olmert and President Abbas uh, made some significant progress in their negotiations. 
And so we need to think about ways of getting those back on the table so that the parties see that they're not starting from 180 degrees apart. Second, we have to think about outside in. In other words, what can the Arab states do to help advance the prospects for peace? And in this respect, the Trump administration accomplished something very positive by fostering the normalization agreements involving the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, and Morocco. Uh, we need to see more of that. The Biden administration has said that it not only supports the current agreements, but will work to advance the prospect of additional agreements. And in addition to their uh, uh, establishing relations between those states and Israel, those states can be helpful to Israel and the Palestinians as the two sides pursue peace. First of all, by uh, showing the Israeli public what peace looks like, investment and tourism, and showing the Palestinians that they will have the support of the Arab world if they make the necessary concessions and compromises in their relationship with Israel. On the right side of the slide, it's called inside out. In other words, a peace process that only takes place between governments is not good enough. We need a process that includes what's called P2P, people to people, activities that bind individuals in Israel and the Palestinian community, Israel and the Arab states. There's a lot of it that actually goes on that's not well known. And the United States has often funded activities designed to promote people to people ties. We also promoted in the 1990s multilateral negotiations that involve the private sector as well as the public sector in dealing with issues that had not been uh, dealt with because of the underlying Israeli-Palestinian uh, problem. And then you also need at the bottom of the slide what I call bottom up. In other words, there has to be a, a better situation on the ground in the West Bank uh, so that Palestinians can live better. They can feel freer, they can move more easily, they can start to build their economy and their institutions of statehood, which is something that's in everybody's interest. You don't wanna create a Palestinian state that immediately becomes a failed state. In between all of this, you can also have what are called CBMs, confidence building measures. In other words, activities designed to build trust and you build in something called accountability where outside parties take a hard look and say to the Israelis and Palestinians, we're actually gonna hold you to do what you say you're gonna do. And we're gonna hold you to avoid doing what you're not supposed to do. And it suggests that with these six elements, there might in fact be a serious prospect for peace in the Middle East. Now, there's one last thing to note uh, as we always do in policy analysis, and that is, what are the black swans? What are the uh, possibilities out there that we may not be taking into account, but that may come back and hurt us in our effort to achieve progress, whether on the Israeli-Palestinian issue or on other issues? And as you go down this list, you can see how significant each one of them is. COVID-19, with, with which we are still coping in the United States, is actually a very serious problem in the entire Middle East other than in Israel. And no one should feel safe believing that the COVID uh, experience can be contained within physical borders. In other words, it's in Israel's interest that its neighbors also grapple with and succeed in dealing with COVID. And if they don't, then the problem could come back and haunt Israel. We know already as we saw in the Israeli press yesterday and today, that the so-called India strain has started to impact in Israel. In other words, the, the virus doesn't know the borders that are reflected on maps. You also have the, the uh, so-called children of ISIS and Al-Qaeda. We administered a significant blow to ISIS, the uh, Islamic State uh, in Iraq and Syria, but we didn't destroy it and they are reviving in decentralized ways, uh, not only in the Middle East, but also across the Sahel, the Sub-Saharan Africa, in Chad and Mali, in Libya, as far uh, west as uh, the southern reaches of Morocco. Uh, so counterterrorism is going to remain a serious problem
And uh, it could be even more serious given the prospect of the United States withdrawal from Afghanistan in September and the resumption or the revival of uh, Al Qaeda bases under the Taliban's uh, governance. And then you have these, the rest of these issues, the conflict spillover uh, from Syria, Yemen, Libya, the possibility almost at any moment of a conflict between Israel and Hezbollah or Israel and Hamas. And we saw that possibility uh, in realistic terms this week as uh, rockets were fired from Gaza and Israel responded. Uh, possibility of an Arab Spring revival, but we also saw an Arab Spring that didn't end up very well in every place except for Tunisia. And what that really reflects is uh, the dysfunctionality of much of the Middle East, state failure, food insecurity, a lack of governance, governance, corruption, and so forth. So this is a very troubled region. It's a region in which the United States continues to have significant uh, uh, interests to play, and uh, one in which the United States and Israel will uh, continue a very strong relationship, even as we try to grapple with the problems that I enumerated. Uh, I would love to leave everybody with a much more optimistic uh, idea of what lies ahead. Uh, I've told uh, people over the years that the one advantage of working on the Middle East is that it's a guarantee of lifetime employment. It's a target rich environment for uh, policymakers, but it's not one that's amenable to easy solutions, uh, certainly not in the immediate period ahead. And for that reason, uh, it's important for us to understand these issues and to contribute uh, intelligently to a public policy debate about what to do on these very challenging choices. So I will stop there. Uh, Rabbi Baird, I'll turn the floor over to you if you want to begin moderating questions. Great, I think uh, Ranan Bustan is actually gonna kick us off. Okay. Hey, um, thank you, Ambassador Kurtzer, um, for a, a really clear and insightful um, picture of the complex issues that um, are facing the region as a whole and Israel in particular. Um, there's, um, we've had quite a number of questions. I wanted to begin with one that I think takes us back to the um, first half or a central part of the talk. Um, uh, what will happen if the negotiations to reinstate the JCPOA fail? Um, you've, you've laid out um, some of the tensions around uh, developments, especially in the move from the Obama administration to the Trump administration. If there are in fact active negotiations and they fail, would a, do you foresee a war breaking out between Israel and Iran? And will you, the U.S. be drawn into that war? Look, I, I personally um, am very worried uh, over the possibility of failure, uh, not because the JCPOA is a perfect agreement. It's far from perfect. It certainly doesn't cover all of Iran's other malign activities. But we've seen the uptick in Iranian nuclear developments since our withdrawal from the JCPOA and if that continues, the movement from 60% enrichment to 90% enrichment is not challenging. I'm not a physicist, but the physicists among us will tell you that it is not easy to get from 3% to 20%. It's not hard to get from 60% to 90%. And once there is uh, that level of enrichment creating a a uh, body of highly enriched uranium available to uh, be weaponized, uh, the options for uh, the rest of us uh, become much narrower. Uh, diplomacy uh, almost comes to an end uh, because Iran uh, may feel that it no longer needs to negotiate. Uh, the resort to uh, more uh, violent measures by Israel and perhaps by the United States becomes a much greater possibility. Uh, and we've seen what happens in other cases once countries uh, join the nuclear club, uh, India and Pakistan and North Korea. 
So you want to stop the program in its tracks, however um, full of holes the agreement is, while you therefore have the possibility, maybe the breathing space of uh, maybe stopping it permanently. Without that, uh, as I say, the, the choice is narrow and the possibility of war uh, goes up exponentially. Thank you. I have a question that um, I think may be on some people's minds as they hear you talk in the community. Um, and it's a really a terminological question. And I'd be curious to hear you reflect on, on this. Um, why do you refer to occupied territories rather than disputed territories in your when you talk about these issues? Well, under international law, the territories are occupied. They're not disputed. Uh, I know there's Israeli legal argument that holds that since uh, only uh, Britain and Pakistan recognize Jordan's uh, annexation of the territories, that these territories essentially reverted status to what was under the British mandate, and therefore uh, Israel has as much a claim as does as do Palestinians. But uh, that's not the internationally accepted legal definition, and it has not been the internationally accepted legal definition for the United States. The U.S. position has always been that these territories are subject to the rules and regulations of the Geneva Convention and the Hague Regulations. Israel, in fact, has said that it doesn't accept the binding nature of Geneva and Hague, but it has said over the years that it is prepared to implement its obligations under those conventions. So, you know, I, I, I respect the idea that there are some people who don't like that legal definition, but that's not the definition that the United States um, has adopted since 1967, and therefore they are the occupied territories. Thank you. Um, I think uh, several people had questions that relate to uh, the role of the United States um, as uh, a possible broker um, for um, negotiating relationships between um, Israelis and Palestinians. Um, I'll formulate it this way. Uh, does the United States still have credibility as an honest broker for a peace plan? And if, they, if the US no longer has that, I'm not sure that what you would say, are the hopes for a lasting peace with the Palestinians dim at this point? Yeah, it's a very good question. And it's one that uh, was being asked even before the Trump administration came into office, but that uh, escalated a great deal during the Trump administration when the United States essentially sought to distance Palestinians from the very peace process that they were supposed to be involved in while supporting uh, virtually everything that Prime Minister Netanyahu wanted. Uh, the question has been raised uh, for many years as to whether or not a country like the United States that has a strong alliance and friendship relationship with Israel can also act as an honest broker between Israel and its negotiating partner. The way we used to think about this 25 years ago when I was in government was that, yes, we could do that because Israel trusted us enough to know that we were not going to do anything that would harm Israeli security, and that we would bend actually in favor of Israel's security in any final status agreement, while at the same time, uh, we could bend in the direction of Palestinians on issues related to uh, borders and governance. Uh, one manifestation of this um, was seen uh, during the Obama administration when the president appointed General John Allen a decorated uh, American uh, general who had been the head of, uh, I think, Central Command and uh, had fought in uh, various wars to work with Israel on a security architecture for a possible post-peace uh, settlement arrangement. And Allen's mandate was to say, uh, okay, Israel believes that its security is uh, pretty good as a result of holding these territories how can we match that if Israel had to give up the territories when it's giving up strategic depth, when it's pulling back from, uh, for example, the Jordan River, 
when it's pulling back from the uh, the ridge, the ridge line that runs north south uh, through the West Bank. And Allen worked uh, quite intensively with a large staff of U.S. military to find a, a very complex set of uh, uh, conditions, uh, which uh, he believed would uh, effectively match the security that Israel enjoys today. Now, we know anecdotally that that study was never released publicly, it's classified. We know anecdotally that the Israeli army was actually quite interested in what Allen found. Uh, the Israeli government didn't want to deal with it, so it didn't go anywhere formally. But uh, after Allen retired, he's now the head of the Brookings Institution. After Allen retired, uh, the Center for New American Strategy published a report that in some ways is a mildly unclassified version of what Allen did. And it's available online, uh, cnas.org. I don't have the, the full citation. But it tells you that this is a, a multi-layered overlapping set of security arrangements <clears throat> that hopefully would provide Israel with uh, the measure of security that it requires. Now, I mention that in detail because um, for Israel, security has always been the paramount uh, issue. And therefore, it has been the paramount issue for the American honest broker as well. Now, the second part of the question, can we still be an honest broker today? I don't know. I really don't know whether we have the credibility after the four years of Trump and after the Trump plan to go back to the two parties and say, you know, we're back in business. Uh, Palestinians don't trust us. Uh, they've made that clear. Even as we try to restore some of the elements that Trump uh, had taken away, communications and assistance. Uh, so it's gonna be hard for us to rebuild the credibility uh, to go back and, and try to mediate this conflict, which uh, unfortunately leaves a vacuum because there's nobody else as well placed as we were uh, to do this, uh, waiting in the wings to take over this role. Thank you. Um, I had um, uh, a question that I guess, yeah, you, have to, you have to go. Sorry, I have a, children entering. Um, uh, I'm curious um, to hear you reflect a little bit about um, developments um, 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 within the governments of other um, important countries in the region, as in particular Saudi Arabia and more recently Jordan, uh, and the kinds of um, internal tensions that you see in particular within the uh, royal families uh, that govern these states and, and whether um, you see an impact on uh, the relationship between Israel and Palestine uh, being affected by what seem to be you know, pretty um, novel developments in those countries. Sure, well, um, they're quite different. Let me start with Saudi Arabia. Um, We've known for years that there has been a growing and quite deep intelligence and security dialogue between the Saudis uh, and the Israelis. Uh, once in a while, you see it out in the open. For example, uh, the permission that's been granted for certain overflight rights over the kingdom that reduces the flying time to the Gulf. Uh, but mostly that relationship has been behind closed doors, in large part because of Saudi sensitivities with regard to their own population, which has grown up supportive of the Palestinian cause, and the Saudi religious establishment, the Wahhabi uh, faction or sect within Islam, that uh, has traditionally taken a fairly hard line on questions relating to Israel. During the uh, Trump administration, there seemed to be a growing willingness on the part of uh, Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince in Saudi Arabia, to be more open with regard to Israel. But on several occasions when that appeared to be the case, he was overruled rather publicly and vocally by his father, the king, King Salman, uh, who made clear that uh, there would be 
no normalization with Israel until a Palestinian state with a capital in Jerusalem <clears throat> was established. Uh, so there's ferment within the kingdom. Uh, we saw uh, some years ago, uh, Mohammed bin Salman uh, jailed uh, many members of his own family, uh, charged them with corruption. Uh, and there's a real question about whether or not a succession in Saudi Arabia will uh, proceed without violence, uh, given the fact that uh, bin Salman now has uh, uh, created so many internal enemies. Uh, the second factor in Saudi Arabia, and this is quite new and I think is probably befuddled the analysts, is that there is now an active dialogue between the Saudis and the Iranians who have been until now mortal enemies. Uh, but the Saudis may be reading the handwriting on the wall. And if they truly believe that in fact, uh, there will be a return to the JCPOA and they don't want a war, their way out may be to uh, figure out a way to normalize relations to some degree with the Iranians. And if they did that, that would of course leave the Israelis without as close a, a covert ally as they believe they have in Saudi Arabia. <clears throat> so the mix of factors here is really quite dramatic. There's a, a quite different issue with respect to Jordan. Uh, the Jordanians, even before the 1994 peace treaty with Israel, uh, always acted as a, uh, a security buffer for Israel on its Eastern front. Uh, Israel was always concerned about an attack from the East, particularly from Iraq, that if it succeeded could cut the state of Israel in half. You remember before 1967, the borders of the state of Israel around the city of Netanya were about nine miles wide from uh, the so-called Green Line to the Mediterranean Sea. And so the Eastern Front has always been a major concern for Israel. But even before 1994 and the peace treaty, the Jordanians did a very good job of, of effectively protecting that border. They did it for their own reasons, but it effectively helped Israel's security. Since 1994, it's become even more intense because the Jordanians have stopped virtually any infiltration uh, across that line, which is the longest line that Israel has on any of its fronts and is now the safest of those lines. So when there is domestic turmoil in Jordan, whether as a result of palace intrigue, we saw the king uh, believing that there was a potential coup attempt or whether it's externally generated. Uh, Jordan has uh, received an influx of uh, refugees from Iraq and Syria that have taxed the kingdom's ability to, to uh, survive. Uh, it's essentially a poor country and it's now bearing the burden of uh, conflicts uh, not of its own choosing. So Israel has an extremely strong national security interest in the security of the Hashemite kingdom. Uh, there are still a few voices in Israel that see Jordan as a future Palestinian state. Um, I normally speak diplomatically, but in this case, I'll say that's one of the stupidest ideas on the table uh, because what you want is a strong Jordan uh, in a sense, containing a future Palestinian state uh, working with Israel, you don't want a Palestinian state the size of Jordan arrayed against Israel. So it makes sense. Uh, and I think virtually all serious Israeli security officials agree, it makes sense to support Jordan and its stability and to help the Hashemite kingdom uh, maintain uh, governance. <clears throat> <clears throat> questions that sort of um, turn more away from the international stage and, and more internal to Israel. Um, it seems that the Israeli political class, or at least the platforms of most of the parties, are not currently prioritizing conversations about the relationship with the Palestinians. Do you think that that's true? Um, and on the flip side, how much is the relationship with Israel a major factor in possible upcoming Palestinian elections? Well, it's certainly true of the Israeli public. As I noted in my formal remarks, uh, 
Israeli governments have, uh, you know, almost uh, blinded themselves to this problem because they haven't been able to take a decision and they haven't seen any pressure from below, from the public to take a decision. You know, there's a, a joke in Israel that's called the Republic of Tel Aviv, where you can live and not ever think about Palestinians. Your outlook is towards the sea and towards the West. Uh, the language spoken is uh, essentially related more to Europe and the United States than it is to the Arab world. Um, and so the Israeli public um, that doesn't live near or in the West Bank uh, doesn't think very much about the Palestinian issue. And in fact, the only time they do think about it is when there's a security uh, challenge. Certainly during the second intifada, which was a period during which I served as ambassador and Palestinian terrorists were infiltrating and blowing up buses and cafes and so forth. Uh, during the period of what's called the lone wolf attacks, individual Palestinians who would you know, just decide one morning they were going to go, go out and try to kill an Israeli. On those occasions, you know, the, the issue was brought home to the population inside Israel proper. But other than that, um, you know, you can visit Israel and not have a conversation about the Palestinian issue if it's not in Jerusalem or in, in, the, uh, in the territories. It's very different on the Palestinian side, in large part because um, of the occupation. Uh, for Palestinians to go from one city to another, they interact with Israeli forces, uh, security forces. They need a permit to travel. They will stand in long lines and have uh, be subject to uh, you know, body searches or whatever. Uh, there are flying checkpoints on roads, some roads they can't even use because they're reserved for settlers. So the day-to-day -day life in the West Bank, uh, in a sense, doesn't allow Palestinians not to think about Israel. Uh, I've been to Ramallah where if, you're only, if you stay in Ramallah, uh, you don't necessarily think about Israel. But when you want to go from Ramallah anywhere else in the West Bank or to Jerusalem, that's the first thing on your mind. Can I, get a, can I get a permit? How am I gonna get there? What kind of challenge will I face at the checkpoints? Uh, will the Israelis believe that um, they have to detain me or deter me from travel? And so it's a, it's a, a constant reminder of, uh, of their situation. That said, it is not that big an issue in the actual elections to the legislative authority. Um, that they're much more going to be determined whenever they're held by competition between the Palestinian Authority and Hamas and on the issue of corruption and uh, the ability to govern. Palestinian public through a lot of polling uh, has been shown to be extremely upset at the poor governance of the Palestinian Authority and about corruption, both among Palestinian Authority officials and Hamas officials. So their elections, you know, pretty much like ours, will focus internally on their own society. But on a day-to-day -day basis, their interactions with Israel uh, never go away. I think there's a follow-up question, given your answers, which is that if the political class and the parties themselves are not, or, are not um, running on issues around uh, resolution to the conflict, um, do you think that there are um, avenues or parties outside of the political process that can um, play a, a role in the negotiations if the political class is not um, going to use its capital, let's say, to um, engage in that process? Yeah, I'm not optimistic. There are, I think, 34 parties registered for the legislative elections. It's almost like the Israeli system. Most of them will not pass the threshold uh, to gain uh, seats in the legislature. Uh, but I, there's, there's no one um, evident right now who will you know, take a Sadat-like decision and uh, make a compelling enough case to the Israeli public to restart 
a peace process. You know, some of the names you hear actually are, are in the opposite direction. Uh, Marwan Barghouti, who's sitting in jail, five consecutive life sentences for killing Israelis, uh, will gain seats in the parliament. Mohammed Dahlan, the former security chief in Gaza, supported by the United Arab Emirates, will gain seats, but um, they don't talk about a peace process. They're talking about power. Uh, you know, what we've known since 2004, when uh, Mahmoud Abbas uh, took over after Arafat died, is that uh, he has been a partner for peace not the perfect partner, hasn't been as heroic a partner as one would have wanted, but he has opposed violence and he has supported the idea of trying to reach an agreement. And yet his popularity is very, very low. So uh, I'm not optimistic that the Palestinian system is going to generate a, um, a Sadat-like figure or a Mandela-like figure that will break this deadlock. Thank you. Um, I think we now have some questions that really kind of turn back towards uh, the United States. Um, uh, one question that really centers on um, the composition of uh, the Democrats and Republicans in Congress. Um, if, since financial aid to Israel is directed by Congress and not the president, are you concerned with the increasingly large number of progressives who are outspoken against Israel with regard to the ongoing aid? Uh, today, I'm not. Uh, you know, you called it increasingly large. It's not that large. You know, they, there's a lot of noise and they, they're certainly vocal, but um, they have not demonstrated the ability to build co a larger coalition than in the previous Congress, I think four, people and now there may be eight or 10. So no, I'm not, I'm not uh, concerned in the short term. In the longer term though, um, you know, the Democratic Party may be changing and there may be more progressive politics across the board within the Democratic Party. Uh, and and that's, uh, that will, will bring to the party uh, voices that also relate to Israel policy. But in the short term, I don't think that's an issue. I would mention one thing, however, and um, I, I co-authored an article, must have been about a year ago, with Yossi Balin, former justice minister in Israel, former deputy foreign minister. Uh, the article basically said, uh, wouldn't it be healthier for Israel to approach the United States and forego security assistance if it could get from the United States a treaty guarantee of the ability to purchase uh, sophisticated weapons and to develop a bilateral uh, program of research and development so that Israel would have, have access to the best technology uh, that the United States can offer. And the argument we made was basically um, Israel should declare its independence. Uh, as long as the United States does provide upwards of $4 billion, you know, in a, in a small, a small way, we have a vote in Israeli policy, and we shouldn't have a vote in Israeli policy. It's an independent, sovereign country. They should make their own decisions. And thank God they're a wealthy country, wealthier than most of Europe, in fact. And so they do have the resources to purchase what they need. What they need from the United States is a guarantee that they will be able to purchase what they need. And so our argument really, um, it, you know, it sounded, some progressives applauded it, but it was not a progressive argument. It was an argument essentially on Israeli nationalism terms. You know, you're, you're big enough and mature enough and rich enough to be able to afford what you need through your own means. Uh, what, you, what, what you require though is a guarantee that you're gonna get what you need. And uh, we felt that through treaty arrangements, which would have to pass through the, the Congress, through the Senate, uh, those kinds of treaties could be arranged. Uh, it's not part of anyone's debate right now, but uh, I know that uh, there are people in Israel who have believed this for quite some time and would like to get out from under this dependent status uh, 
that Israel has been in for such a long uh, period. Um, I think we have just um, two more questions, if we can hold you here for a couple sure. of minutes. Um, um, the question of, uh, in particular, uh, this week, Human Rights Watch and its report uh, that um, argue that um, Israel and its occupation of uh, can be understood through the framework of apartheid, um, as well as B'Tselem's report um, some time ago at the beginning of the year, um, uh, have, have obviously um, been very provocative. Um, uh, can you reflect a little bit for us on um, how these reports and this debate and this language of apartheid as applied to Israel, um, the kind of impact it's having on college campuses and more broadly on Jewish communities uh, around the world? Yeah, I, I think the unfortunate um, aspect of both of those reports is the degree to which they're gonna send everybody to opposite corners. In other words, if the discussion is, uh, how do you promote better living conditions for Palestinians and a less intrusive occupation and more sensitivity on the part of Israel for Palestinian rights, um, you can actually build coalitions, including on college campuses. Once you call Israel an apartheid state or say that it commits crimes against humanity, then even critics of Israeli policy uh, you know, get off the boat at that point and say, no, that's, it's so wrong that the underlying basis of the charge uh, can't be trusted anymore. Uh, so whereas I think there are many people who, who would rely on the studies that either B'Tselem or Human Rights Watch would do in the past in order to make the argument for different Israeli conduct, uh, you can't use that material anymore because of the degree to which uh, both organizations have now taken a kind of editorial position, which is so inimical to uh, the values that we hold dear. Um, I don't know yet how it's going to play on college campuses. I think it will certainly exacerbate the situation on those campuses where there have already been problems. Uh, some of the uh, California State University campuses, even Columbia to some extent in New York, um, which have uh, large communities of uh, not just students, but faculty that uh, uh, raise these issues all the time, uh, they now have a banner under which they can, they can uh, you know, demonstrate and, and protest. And that banner is, you know, it's like the marquee on a movie theater. You don't have to give a, a whole paragraph about uh, closures or restrictions on movement. You just say Israel equals apartheid, and you know the the problem is uh, resolved. And so I think on some campuses this will make things very very uh, hard and very challenging. Uh, it what it means in a place like Princeton, where it's been things have been relatively quiet. We did have. Uh, a couple of petitions maybe six years ago uh, regarding the boycott, divestment and sanctions movement. But since that time, um, I've been working with uh, a Palestinian American professor uh, on what we call conversations about peace. And our objective has been to bring the, the groups on campus together to talk about things, not with the objective of convincing anybody of anything but just to get them to talk and to see each other as, as people, even if they differ on the issues. And the campus therefore has been relatively quiet. Uh, so I think those are the two, the two immediate thoughts in mind uh, where the problem will get worse and where more dialogue uh, among the groups on campus uh, can get us beyond this, uh, these rather horrific, uh, uh, this horrific terminology that uh, HRW and, and B'Tselem have used. Thank you. Um, the, the final question was actually, you began to move in that direction and I don't wanna put you too much in, in the hot seat, but um, 
I'll ask it this way anyway, because I think this is um, very much connected to the- That's okay. I've, I've been uh, in the hot seat for years. It's I'm sure, yeah. uh, IDIC um, and, uh, and TJC. Um, so in this kind of uh, climate of political polarization, um, how do you think communities like ours can best um, discuss these issues constructively? It's different from students who may identify with Israel or with, with Palestinians, um, but internal to our um, community. What are some of the strategies that you would um, advise us to take as a community? Well, you know, not to pat you on the back, but the creation of, of this IDIC and you know, your willingness to bring in a variety of voices, obviously with limits, you're not gonna bring in a, a Sone Yisrael, a, an enemy of Israel. Um, and in the same way, it probably doesn't pay to bring in, you know, someone from the Kahanist uh, uh, faction in Israel. But uh, the more voices that you can uh, 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 bring into the uh, debate within the community, hopefully at some point being able to do it in person so that there is a real interaction, not you know, mediated through, through Zoom, uh, becomes in my view, the healthiest way to proceed. Uh, you know, within the community, people will have their own mechanisms for political action uh, through uh, APAC, through J Street, through New Israel Fund, through whatever, and that's fine. But as a community, um, the important thing is, is to be able to talk to each other and to do so civilly, even on matters where there are, such, uh, there are hot seats and where there is such uh, discord on, uh, on uh, policy. The one thing I, I tried to do at various points tonight was to indicate that there are no right and wrong answers on many of these policy issues. There are assessments made by one side or the other of what's preferable, but neither side, for example, on JCPOA or even on the Palestinian issue can say, I am right and you are wrong. It's just, it's not doable because we don't know uh, what would be the result of the policies that, uh, uh, that move in one direction or the other. It's based on assessments, evaluations, good judgment, uh, good character, and uh, all of that benefits from dialogue and communication. Thank you. I think um, I will turn it over uh, to um, my colleagues on the committee um, to take us through the end of the session. I want to thank you very much for your willingness to engage in this very productive conversation. My pleasure. Ambassador Kurtzer, uh, on behalf of tonight's attendees and the members of the Israel Dialogue Initiative Committee, I want to thank you for a most interesting talk, which was really enlightening to me, and I thought I knew about the Middle East. Anyway, all of us are very, very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you, Moshe, and thank you, uh, Ambassador Kurtzer. Thank everyone for attending this really informative and enlightening presentation. Um, one can only hope that all parties involved in this are thoughtfully addressing all of the complex issues and analyzing them along lines that were discussed by the ambassador tonight as they try to achieve some progress in the Middle East. Um, for your information, tonight's program has been recorded. Everyone who registered will receive the link to the recording early next week. Um, so you can look forward to that and go back over the information that, uh, that you want to. I'm particularly pleased to announce that IDIC has two more programs planned for this fall. These lectures will continue our series started last year, unraveling the complexities of the Israeli legal system. The first program will consider Israel's civil rights laws and how they are applied. And the second will examine the legal system as it is implemented across the Green Line. 
Dates and speakers have not been finalized yet, but when they are, all of you attending tonight will receive email notification about these programs so you can register to attend. We hope that you enjoyed tonight's presentation and found it worthwhile. Your feedback to IDIC is welcome and appreciated and inevitable. <laughs> if you would like to support the Israel Dialogue Initiative Committee's programming and mission, you can make a donation to that effect by contacting and directing it to the Jewish Center office. Once again, thank you to my colleagues. Thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you, Ambassador Cursor. Please stay safe, stay well, and stay engaged. Good night, all.